Good morning, everyone. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, everyone. I don't know about you. I'm so grateful to be here. I'm grateful to be alive. I'm grateful that the Lord woke me up this morning, put breath in my body, uh, gave me a mind to serve him, clothed me in my right mind this morning, and um, made it possible for me to make it here and celebrate who he is every day. Um, but today, uh, in particular with you all, I'm, I'm so, so grateful to be here. And I think it's, um, it is wonderful that your church pauses at this moment to honor um, Dr. King and his work, his life, and the work of peacemakers um, in our world. Um, Dan, when he asked me to, to preach, he said, you know, um, we're going to honor some people and we want um, some kind of word. We're, we're talking about justice. And um, I love the scripture that talks about us being peacemakers. But what I recognize is that it, the Bible says that we are peacemakers and not peacekeepers. Um, because to, to be a peacemaker is very different than to be a peacekeeper. Very often, keeping the peace is the enemy of justice, right? Um, and making the peace requires that we enter into some kind of warfare, um, that we enter into battle um, so that we can get to true peace. And, and peace really only, real peace only follows absolute justice. Um, and so this morning I was thinking um, as I was putting this together that um, I come from a, a, a large family. I have six brothers. And all of my brothers are um, extremely athletic. I grew up with a fanatic kind of a father who likes sports, gambling, um, watching sports, playing sports. He would have been a decathlonist in the 68 Olympics, but my mother got pregnant with me and he had to go get a job. Um, so, but he was like really a fanatic about like training my brothers. Two of my brothers are professional athletes and um, a few of the other ones really should have been. And I, I only say that because um, I grew up uh, watching sports and learning um, about how battle, like kind of learning the art of war by watching sports. And uh, I, I believe that I've learned that many fights are won or lost before the fight actually begins. I think about how um, during a press conference, often we will see the opponents sitting together and they will just start talking trash about each other. And uh, depending on what they say and uh, what they, how they talk about the other person, um, the idea is that one will intimidate the other one. And then right before like a good boxing match when they stand like nose to nose and they're staring each other eye to eye, like the whole idea is that the fight has already begun. Fights begin before the bell, before the first blow is ever thrown. Um, and so the stare down is really important because again, the, this part of war is intimidation. The power of fear and intimidation is a very, very powerful thing and the enemy uses it against us all of the time. So, so many people win just because they believe that they are in fact the winner. And so many people lose because they enter the fight believing that they are the loser. Um, and many of us, most of us, have lost most battles in our lives because we just choose not to fight at all. Most of us have lost battles by forfeit. I think about how many times God has given me charge to do something or some great idea or some way to solve a real problem. And I have talked myself out of it before I ever tried to talk myself into it, before I prayed, before I fasted, before I talked to another person about it, before I went to the scripture to see what God has said about that. Um, I have forfeited before I even began. It's important that we ask ourselves how we think about fighting. Uh, one of the big battles in the Bible that we all are familiar with is that between David and Goliath. But what we often do is talk about the actual battle between the two of them. What I wanna tell you today is that the fight between David and Goliath was won 
before he ever picked up the first stone. If you would turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. And we'll begin at verse 31. 1 Samuel chapter 17, beginning at verse 31. And the Bible reads, Now when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul, and he sent for him. Then David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fall because of him. Your servant will go and fight with the Philistine. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against the Philistines to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep, and when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of its flock, I went out after it and I struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and I struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he is he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Bless the reading of God's word. Just pray with me for a moment. Father God, in the name of Jesus, God, I thank you for this moment to stand before your people and to preach your holy word. I ask you, God, that I would decrease and in me you would increase so that there is less of me and more of you until there is none of me, God, and it is only you. God, you have your way in this place today. Anoint the ears of those who have come to hear. Let it be, God, that they hear from you and not from me. Divide this word in as many ways as there are people here and make it personal. Heal, deliver, correct, inform. Uh, God, I pray that you would bless. Do what only you can do in this moment. Use your word in a powerful way. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And so you have to make a choice. You have to make a choice at some point in your life to get out of the stands and on to the field. Here, David chooses to fight. How many battles have you won or lost because you have you lost because you would not even start? You would not apply yourself. You would not try. You wouldn't even consider it. Before this fight, we see that David considered what was at stake. He understood that this was a battle that was about God's people and about their well-being and about their advancement. He understood that there were a people of God who were oppressed by these Philistines who were uncircumcised and who had no right over God's people. How God was with him in the battle he considered, the battles of his life, and thought that God may show up like that again. Sometimes we pick the battles, and other times the battles of our lives pick us. The people of God were oppressed by the Philistines, and they wanted and needed and deserved change, freedom, and liberation. But no one would dare fight against this oppressive force. The Philistines have sent the biggest, baddest warrior of them all. They have sent Goliath, over nine feet tall, about twice the size of David. David is only about five feet tall. He's about two times his height, probably two times his weight, and probably has twice his reach. He was stronger, he was more experienced, and he was more skilled at the art of war. And we see that it's Saul who reminds David of this. But David has something that no one else in the crowd has. David has willingness. David has courage. David has faith. David thinks that he can take him. He is at least willing to get off the bench and into the ring. 
He knows that his people will lose if he stays on the sidelines. And I want to tell you today that we will lose if any of us decide that we will only sit on the sidelines. He volunteers. He shows up. He understands that showing up will be half of the battle. He has a willingness to fight. And I want to tell you that God needs your availability. God needs for you to just say, I'll go, Lord, send me. For years and years, I worked in prison, probably about 15 years. And um, what I found over and over again as I spoke to people there, especially the men, and I would dare say especially the men who were doing the, the most time, uh, these people understood racism, they understood classism, they understood greed, and they understood oppression. They understood all kinds of systems and how they worked against them. Many of them could have written a dissertation on the many ways that poverty, addiction, poor housing, dilapidated educational systems, stress, no support, poor health care, economic challenges have led to their incarceration. But while they could explain what the problems were, here they sit in jail, victimized by the very systems that they understood. Incarceration, they would say, is modern day slavery. And they would see that they are slaves to the system. But while they understood the problem and could articulate many philosophies around a solution, they were sitting under the oppression of those who had come and taken advantage of them because of greed. It's all just commentary coming from them, I would think, because they are volunteering to be swallowed alive by the enemy. They have sat on the sidelines of life for too long. They refuse to get in the fight and to change things. To not fight is to accept defeat and all of its ramifications. David understood that he had to make an effort. He was like Isaiah, I'll go, Lord, send me. Saul doubts his ability. He says, no, you won't, in verse 33. Um, he tells David that he's unable to. And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him. For you are a youth and a man of war, and he has been a man of war since his youth. I guess this makes good sense in the natural, but David doesn't operate in the natural. David volunteers because he understands how God works in the supernatural. I want to tell you that sometimes the opposition is the enemy that we know, and sometimes the opposition is the enemy that we really, really, really know. Sometimes the opposition is one of our very own. Historically, we know that our own family can be our enemy sometimes. Our siblings, our coworkers, our ministry partners, and sometimes we can even see how our parents have damaged us. Those called to help us, those given authority over us, sometimes they have led us astray. They have discouraged us rather than encouraged us. They put their fears and their limitations and their small perceptions that are based in fear on us. The king should have had a plan, but instead he was in his feelings. Fear has become his God, and we bend often to our fear rather than to our faith. He was able to see that David was smaller and Goliath was bigger, that David was weaker and Goliath was stronger, that David had little experience and Goliath had much, and that David, by profession, was only a shepherd boy while Goliath was, in fact, a warrior. God wants you to choose your faith over your fears. If you are going to fight in the army of the Lord for things that are important to God, for things that really make a difference, it is important that your fears are not the God that you bow to. God is not 
a genie in a bottle. He will not just work magic. He will not open up the windows of heaven and just magically change the things that we know are wrong in the world. In fact, what God really wants is for you to be present and participating. Don't just pray for change. Ask God how you can participate. God doesn't want to entertain you with his miracles. He wants to use you as an instrument, an example, and an ambassador of his will. God wants change as much as you do, but he always calls people to battle. You do the possible, and God will show you the impossible. Get on the field and try to get in the fight. Choose faith and make a decision. Whether it's political, economic, social system, or social systems that work against us, we know they are like Goliath. They are big, they are strong, and they are far-reaching. We accept and we live under oppressive systems. Feeling overwhelmed makes us feel paralyzed by them. So we do nothing and we accept the suffering and we accept defeat. David chose fear, a faith over his fear and over Saul's fear and over the fear of others. Faith over fear. Imagine that, that God's people would choose faith over fear. The other thing that David did was he chose faith over the facts. He knew that Goliath was a warrior and he knew that Goliath was bigger than him. He knew that other people were afraid of Goliath, but he still chose faith. Sometimes we can count the cost and that counting counts us out. Saul gives the rundown about why he can't win, but David has a response. David pulls out his very own resume, and I dare you to do the same when you are confronted by the fears of your life. He says that there was a lion and there was a bear, and he grabbed them by the beard, and he beat them. God has done amazing things in your life, I'm sure. And God has made it possible for you to see miracles, for you to be involved in what seem to be impossible things. And if you would just look back over your life and remember that many of the things that you prayed for, if you had enough courage to walk by faith and not by sight, then you saw the glory of the Lord here in the land of the living. There are battles that you have won just because you were willing to stand up and fight. There are battles where you were definitely the underdog, where people had counted you out, where you should not have won at all. You have a resume of how God has shown up in your life and used you to do spectacular, glorious, miraculous, unexpected and unexplainable things. And all you were were faithful and available. What we learn is from David is that uh, there are transferable skills. The first thing that we have to transfer is our faith. If we did it before, then we can do it again. If you have accomplished things in your past that you thought could never happen. Maybe you can accomplish something that is right before you. If you've won a battle before, perhaps God just has another battle for you to win. I often tell people um, in, in my congregation, I, I have um, a lot of young people, I do community work much like you all do. And I um, believe that the gospel is seen um, more than it is heard by people. And so um, at our church, we have a preschool, an after school, a summer camp, a college prep, a college retention program. We have a bunch of other community programs. We feed people, we counsel people, we clothe people. Um, and we just try to be so visible with God's love um, and try to make God's love really, really apparent to people. But, but I know that one of the things that I find often in the community that I work in is that when I speak to young people about going to college, they feel so intimidated. 
or when I tell people about my own education, they suddenly think that I am so brilliant. And then I always try to follow up and tell them that I'm not that smart, really. I think I'm pretty average. I know a lot of people who are way smarter than I am. The difference between people who have college degrees and people who do not is usually that they did something the other people were just not willing to do. And usually it's not because they didn't want to do it, but because they were afraid. See, all I've done to have all the degrees that I have, so I wasn't extra brilliant. I was determined. I showed up. I wrote papers, and I paid that tuition. And then I showed up, and I wrote some more papers, and I paid some more tuition. <laughs> and then I showed up, I wrote even more and more and more papers, mostly just repeating the ideas of other people. proving that I had read the literature, maybe synthesizing a couple of people's ideas and giving my own opinion once in a while. But it wasn't brilliant. And then I paid some more tuition. And that really is the only difference between me and someone who doesn't have a college degree. The other difference, the spiritual difference, is that I believe that I could. And many of them just don't believe that they can. It has nothing to do with ability, capacity, intelligence, brilliance. Not at all. I know it. I've been in college long enough to know there's a lot of people there who are not so bright. Not bright at all. And I've been in the street long enough to know and in prisons long enough to know and in shelters long enough to know that a lot of brilliance is not in college, not in school at all. It really is about what we believe and what we are willing to do, those transferable skills. David said, yes, I'm a shepherd boy, but I believe because I have been fighting as a shepherd boy, I might be able to fight as a warrior right now. Because I believed God then, I will believe God now. Because God showed up in the field where my sheep were, he might show up in this field where this Goliath is. We understand systems and we use skills for this kingdom to build the kingdom of God. And that's why there are things like food pantries and after school programs and counseling and marches and housing and hospitals that we build. I don't know what field God is calling you to, but get on it. If you've heard the voice of the Lord and you know that there is a battle that awaits your presence, don't listen to the naysayers if God be for you. Who shall be against you? Uh, I dare for you to believe in God and to trust in God and to make some decisions. Um, I, I, I made a decision a couple years ago, right before the pandemic. Um, I guess I've been making the decision for quite a, a long time. A couple of years ago, about 10 years ago, I got Lyme disease. And uh, it went unchecked for almost a year. And so I was um, going blind. I couldn't speak. I had um, early onset of Alzheimer's. I um, was almost in a wheelchair. I couldn't barely walk. Um, I was seeing um, specialists for almost every single part of my body, my liver, my kidneys, my heart, my brain. Um, and the last thing that this psychiatrist wrote after uh, evaluating me, he said, at the rate of diminution, within three months, Ms. Wright will not be able to take care of herself or her four children. She should not work any longer, and her future looks bleak.
And so from that point on, I started doing other things. Thank God, God made a way, right? They figured out what was wrong with me and started treating me and miraculously because things were not supposed to change. They did. And that's why I stand here today so humbled that I can even put a sentence together because I couldn't. One day I got in the shower and didn't know what the shampoo and the body wash was for. Another day I bent down to tie my shoes and made the first knot and didn't know how to make the bunny ears. I've been a teacher for over 30 years. I've taught hundreds of children how to make bunny ears and tie their shoes. Um, and so I'm grateful today. But I started making these very small changes to become healthy. And I always share with people, people are like, Pastor, you don't eat meat? I'm like, no, I don't eat meat. And they're like, how do you not eat meat? Do you not like meat? I'm like, I love meat. I miss roast pork. I miss the fat on steak. I miss the skin on the fried chicken. I miss the grease coming down the side of my lips. I miss meat. I love eating meat. And I still remember what it tastes like, but I know that it's not good for me. And so it's not that I made a grand decision to never eat meat again. It's that I make a decision every time I sit down to the table or I stand in my kitchen to not eat meat at my next meal. That's it. These are little decisions that we make that lead us to change things in our lives. They're small decisions of faith. You know, the Bible says when we say that God will be a lamp unto our feet, and I, I always think about that when I have big things ahead of me because I think, God, I just need you to show me the next step. I, I know I don't get to see the end of the road or the entire path. I just get to see and take the next step with you. Um, let me just say that there's another person in this story that I, I just want to make mention of because I think that it's important, and that is Saul. You know, there's a moment when Saul puts his fears on David. And I want to tell you that people will put their fears on you. People will tell you why you can't and why you shouldn't and why it could never happen. Don't listen to them. Know the promises of God and always turn to those and trust those above all people. Now, the other thing I want to tell you is I dare you not to be like Saul. I dare you not to put your fears on other people. I just want to share this story with you. Um, I have four children, and one of my children um, is a girl, uh, my second oldest. She told me when she was 15 that she wanted to go away to a boarding school, and I had already sent my son away. I went away to prep school when I was 14 years old, and I hated it. I absolutely hated it. It was horrible to me. It was one of the worst experiences of my life. So when my children said that they wanted to go, I was afraid for them, very afraid for them. When my daughter, I, I, and I, I thought my son could make it because boys socialize in a different way than girls do. Like if y'all could play sports together, y'all cool with each other. It really doesn't matter race, color, creed. Like if you could just figure out how to do something together, and if someone can do something well, guys seem to respect each other that way. Girls are not like that, especially not at 14 and 15 and 16. They are petty and they are mean. And I feel like, I felt like she needed me. So anyway, I let her go away because I didn't want to put my fear on her and I didn't want to put clothe her in my experience. I didn't want to put my armor on her, my, the things that were my defense mechanisms. I didn't want to make them hers. She was going to be bold enough to step into the ring and I was going to let her. Well, a few months in, she called me and she said, I want to come home. She was in tears. She said, I hate it here and I hate these people and I hate how they treat me and I hate that I feel like I don't belong from the morning at breakfast to classes to going to teachers to social stuff. Like, I don't belong here. This place was not created for me. And I said, the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof and everything that dwells in it. And it all belongs to you. I don't care who made it and why they made it and who they made it for. If God put you there, it's yours. So I want to come home and I want to come home right now. Can you please come get me? I got to get out of here. I hate it here, mommy. I said, no, you can't come home. You can't come home until you pass every class. 
You can't come home until you play a varsity sport and you can't come home until you're a leader in that place. If you can do all of those things, then you can make a decision to come home, but you will not come home failing. You will not come home beaten and you will not come home being overwhelmed by a system that beat you down. Beat the system and then you can make a decision from a place of power, not defeat. When I hung up the phone, I was hyperventilating, <laughs> crying. I, that night I was in a fetal position, praying. Someone was in my office and when I hung up, they were like, are you crazy? That was so mean, how are you? I can't believe you did that, Pastor. Let her, they were crying to, for me to let her come home. It was one of the hardest decisions I've ever made as a parent. That little girl is 27. She moved, she has traveled all over the world. She started traveling at 15 at boarding school. Every opportunity to get out of there, she took it. Got a passport and has a million stamps. Um, she's a film producer now, a Grammy award winning film producer and probably right now produced what will be the biggest, one of the biggest documentaries coming in the, in the year to come. Um, she moved to LA at 23 and she's very happy. She lives on her own. She had no family or no nothing. I've told her to come home plenty of times because I miss her. And every time she says, nope, I'm doing my thing. I am conquering every fear and I'm living my life. COVID happened and she said to me, mommy, you know, my generation felt like, we, like this just really took everything out of us. Um, everyone was like an entrepreneur and excited and we felt like we were in charge and taking over the world and now none of my friends wanna work. They all don't know what they're doing and have no motivation anymore. And I said to her, well, what about you? She said, no, 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 I live with purpose. I don't have a choice. I have to wake up every day and make the world a better place. This idea that we would put our fears on other people, that we would counsel people with fear that we would pass on the things that intimidate us or our defense mechanisms to our children, to people we supervise at work or even in ministry, we have to be really, really careful of that. Because we may be making peacekeepers, but we will not make peacemakers. We won't make people who want to change the world. We will make people who go along to get along. David was able in verse 36, he says that he's not afraid of some uncircumcised Philistine. The reason he says this is because the enemy that he sees is not in relationship with God. And he knows that this giant, I love that in the word giant, the word ant is there. So whenever I think something is a giant in my life, I figure out how to shift my perspective and shrink it down to bite size so that it only looks like an ant to me. He said that he, would, he could take this uncircumcised Philistine who did not know God. He says, moreover, in verse 37, I hear the babies coming. Moreover, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. So first David says, I beat the bear. And I beat the lion. And then he says, no, 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 no. It wasn't just me and me alone. You would have seen me fighting. But God was there. He was the one who delivered me. He was the one who got me through it. God is the one who healed you. God is the one who delivered you. God is the one who made a way when it seemed like there was no way. God is the one who blessed you. God is the one who provided for you. God is the one and the only one who made the miracles of your life happen. And he is the God, not of one or two or three miracles, but if you look back over your life, he is the God of many miracles, and if he did it before, he will do it again. If we look at David, what he tells us to do is to look at God. God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. It's not David, but it's the God that David knows. It is the God that David depends on. It is the God that David turns to. It is the God that David prays to. It is the God that David believes will win this battle. David 
in his own strength was no match for a lion or for a bear. But he could look at the giant and see the giant is no match for God. Faith grows with experience. Don't ever let go of the experiences and the things that God has gotten you through. This uncircumcised one, he says, this person who is not of faith, this Philistine, the enemy of God, the size, the strength, the history of any person, any government or any system is no match for the God who we know loves us. David sees Goliath as an enemy of God, and I dare you to see greed as an enemy of God, hate as an enemy of God, oppression as an enemy of God, racism, classism, sexism, homelessness, child abuse, sex trafficking, ignorance, addiction, poverty, hunger. I dare you to see those things as an enemy of God. These enemies of God have to go. They are an offense to the God who loves his people. We join God. We allow God to use us. We avail ourselves to God. We can only do that if we shift our perspective. Fear makes giants grow, but faith shrinks the giants that are in our way. Faith shrinks the giants that offend God. We make our giants now bite size. The Lord who delivered Daniel, the Lord who delivered David, the Lord who delivered the children of Israel, the Lord who delivered Jonah, the Lord who delivers his people time and time again will deliver us. Our God travels. He goes into the stormy seas to rescue the disciples. He goes to the bottom of the ocean to rescue Jonah. He goes to Egypt to set his children free. We find God in prisons and in palaces. And then we know that our God even goes to the cross. He goes to the grave. He goes to hell to get the keys. He comes back to earth and now he sits in heaven. He sits in heaven at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us day and night. And he fights our battles for us until he comes again. I dare you to get out of your seat, to stop being a bystander, to stop being afraid, and to get on the battlefield. To stop being a peacekeeper and to be a peacemaker. God bless you. Let me pray for you. Father God, in the name of Jesus, God, we thank you for today. We thank you, God, for your word, which reminds us of your power, of your grace, of your mercy, of your love, of your provision, and of your determination to win. God, I pray that every person here, God, that they consider the battles that you have called them to and God that they would not talk themselves out of but into a fight God I pray that they would fight for you and that they would see the glory of the Lord in the land of the living bless them Lord in Jesus name we pray amen bless you church